Okay, welcome everyone to another CV talk. Uh, I'm glad to have you. So this is probably will be the last CV talk before the CVPR deadline, and then we'll back after CVPR. Uh, today we have Jie Zhang Yu. Uh, some of you may know him. He was previous postdoc at EPFL. As I mentioned, biomedical imaging group uh, led by Michael Anser. And now he's assistant professor and director of the Lab of Advanced Imaging Technology at Ulsa National Institute of Technology. So his background is intersection of computer vision and signal processing. Uh, mainly his expertise is on generative models and solving inverse problems. So today he's going to cover some of his papers either published at EPFL or recently, uh, probably ICCV 2021. And the title of today's talk is Toward a Truly Unsupervised Image Manipulation Model. So feel free to ask questions during the talk, or you can just write a question in the chat box. Uh, Jay Jung, welcome. Uh, floor is yours. You can start. Uh, OK, hello. I'm Jay Jung. Thank you for your kind invitation. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Vozo Tavar, like, uh, I don't you can know call me this. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I uh, had uh, introduced me like uh, until this July, I was working at EPFL with uh, Michael Windsor. And now I am an assistant professor in graduate school of AI at National Institute of Science and Technology in my home country, South Korea. Uh, so today I will introduce some of my recent works on improving image manipulation models in various ways. Uh, actually, my the topics are quite in a broad like a uh, spectrum so I try to make it into a single sim but anyway I, but it is it, let, let's see how it goes um, so since the development of generative adversary networks which I guess everybody knows uh, we are witnessing a very fast improvements in various areas in computer vision especially in image manipulation models like for example in pix to pix uh, Philip Isola showed that you can actually make a semantic image synthesis and edge to image kind of tasks. And after then, uh, the uh, Junyan Ju, I have shown that like uh, you even don't need a pair data set to make such kind of image translation happen. So you can use a cyclic loss to uh, uh, train such kind of image transfer model. And I guess that uh, Tessan Park, one of my friends, also uh, delivered a lecture in this uh, uh, this series of talk. Uh, the spade uh, has showed that, yeah, now even a layman can uh, design a really fancy images by just uh, putting some like a pixel, like uh, 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 the, the really a rough uh, drawing and make it to your really uh, nice, uh, realistic uh, image. The way it needs a little more improvement yet. Um, more recently, uh, Transformer is giving another big impact to the field. And now we are witnessing a model that can even design an armchair with a few lines of instructions in natural language. As you can see here, uh, you can even, like, it is called DALI. And um, uh, you, know, you can write it down like an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And then you can already, like you can actually visit their site website. I think you already know, but there, and you can try a lot of different things. And um, how they do is like using a billions of images and text pairs with a very, very big model. Uh, they show that uh, model, this kind of, by using that uh, a lot of resources, a model can learn to perform such complicated tasks, like such as designing an armchair like this. Uh, but seeing this, uh, one might say that the big model and big data are all you need, but if you look into it in, in a, a little in detail, the situation is quite different and actually difficult and even far from being solved in many practical applic applications. So today I, I'm kind of trying to boil it down to this kind of things that, you know, there's in real life, and life is not easy. There's a lot of constraints in real world. Uh, even though the, your model looks like this can solve like such kind of complicated models based on your data, uh, usually that data itself, uh, the collecting that data itself is really expensive and laborious task. Um, uh, moreover, uh, unless you can uh, collect a 
infinite number of samples, there must be always a training task gap, right? And um, sometimes while you are, even though you would try to gather the data in a really unbiased bias sense, uh, you might uh, unintentionally include some kind of bias into the data, even though you uh, kind of collect a lot of ones, you or system is biased already, it might happen. So that uh, data, collecting the data in a really fair way, in a general way, is really a hard task, right? And um, uh, the, collect, the collecting procedure itself would have some cause, some kind of bias, by a, by a human bias. Right, and other than that, uh, even more uh, in some applications like uh, medical imaging, usually uh, sometimes it is even impossible to acquire data, a single data itself, the clean one. I mean, that to actually to train such kind of international imaging model, you feel it grant as if it is grant granted that the clean data, at least the images which we want to translate into or from, is kind of it is free to get, uh, or it is really easy to get. But in some applications, in some practical situations, it, even a single clean data data is impossible to uh, measure, or or like uh, because of the physical system itself, or if it's because of the physics included in the measurement system, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And for sure that there is a you you always have a finite resource. Uh, not only for data itself, but also in the uh, computation power or, and when you, if you are a newcomer in this field or you are the actually layman user who want to use such kind of uh, powerful techniques and translate such kind of power into your area, it is quite prohibited as, current, as a current uh, uh, algorithm as it is. So the training procedure is not that uh, easy, even for the uh, experts in the computer vision area. So that kind of constraints are there, still there in real worlds. And I, uh, I, I try to like uh, always uh, when I see some computer vision task, I always try to. Uh, I, I think everybody does, but all of us try to like uh, uh, make the model more flexible or kind of free some constraint in some way. So that I try, I will, uh, I, I will kind of like uh, introduce you like my recent work, such as like Cutler, uh, like a, which is a data augmentation method uh, to kind of make your model much more stronger while with a less uh, number of data and also improve the generalization when you are, your model is tested on in the real life. And uh, so that I will show such kind of thing Cutler uh, first and then I don't know, the Stargun version two and TuneIt, actually I will uh, introduce only TuneIt uh, for the sake of the time, but um, the, the Stargun version two is actually uh, have uh, freed the, uh, uh, the, the dependency to the model that you, in fact, the, if you want to translate one domain to the other, you need uh, beforeward, you needed to uh, have a model which uh, can, which are trained specifically for that A to B domain kind of things, or B to A, or uh, in, there was some model before then like called Stargun, but which could do that to the multi-domain translation, but it was quite restricted uh, because it couldn't uh, generate a multiple, uh, multi multiple images of that domain. So that I kind of, like, we have extended to the version two, and that was the some kind of, uh, uh, way to free the constraints in some way. But uh, still, I will show you that still that kind of image translation model had a constraint that uh, you needed a really a nice pair data having, a, I mean that actually the, you are unintentionally, was in, unintentionally using some supervision of domains that from there actually you are collecting while you are collecting the data, there is a domain A or domain B so that you are kind of making a task from one domain to the other so that you are actually, while you are collecting data, you are actually uh, putting some uh, domains or you are biased into the data itself. So that uh, what we uh, did in TuneIt was you, the model can itself can learn how many domains are there in the data and they learn freely between the domains, how to translate between each other, among each other. And um, as I told you in the medical imaging domain, uh, even a single data is actually 
uh, sometimes it is impossible to acquire single clean data. And uh, uh, in this last work in time dependent DB prior, which I published in a journal paper is now is about that kind of task, which is really in a harsh uh, constraint that you only have a single data with a, a corrupted measurements. So first thing first, uh, the, the first thing is about the data aggregation. So this is the work I published in CVPR two, two, 2020. So uh, it, is, it was of the first uh, data augmentation method for uh, not only for image super resolution, but for a low level vision tasks. So uh, let's begin. So um, the motivation of this work was like this. Uh, you know, there are various levels of vision tasks. And uh, you know that when we say about high level uh, vision, it is about some semantic recognition, like a, a classification for uh, is a representative uh, task in the high level computer vision task. And there actually you have a lot of, a lot of uh, works done in data augmentation to uh, improve such kind of data hungry uh, situation, right? Uh, uh, some um, uh, really famous method would be cut out, can mix, or mix up. So there's a lot in there. But I kind of like a focus on the low level vision task as well. Uh, like a, I mean by here, low level, we uh, are more closer to the pixel uh, uh, representation. So that a lot of image restoration tasks like super resolution or denoising. Uh, there is also a lot of like working works are done, but still uh, only there there's nothing on data augmentation. I was like wondering why is it so, and uh, maybe because it is too easy and already sort solved. But uh, actually, it is not. The low level vision task itself is a really uh, a hard. Uh, hard problem so that they still need some a lot of improvements but uh, strangely there was not much uh, work done on the data augmentation so uh, the first thing you can do when you do the research on the uh, new area uh, with uh, to, is that you can just uh, try the existing works uh, to the uh, existing method in the other area to your own area. I mean that uh, you can use other like a data augmented measures which you were developed for other like a high level vision text and apply it to the low level vision, right? So uh, this is the analysis uh, uh, I did for uh, for low level vision test, for example, in super resolution, for example, I will uh, first uh, focus on super resolution for uh, convenience. And so what I first found is actually uh, sharp transitions and mixed uh, image contents or losing the relationship between the pixels can significantly de degrade the uh, image restoration performance, which is quite uh, intuitive. Right. And uh, even more like uh, every feature domain methods, like, uh, you know, there's a lot of methods which actually uh, perturbs the feature domain. Uh, not, uh, for example, you can uh, uh, drop out. And drop out is one of the uh, featured, somehow feature domain augmentation or some like a, a gen improving generalization methods so that you can, uh, uh, your model can uh, have a better accuracy or better like a performance when tested uh, in the wild. But um, such kind of uh, manipulation in the feature was so uh, detrimental for the low level vision test. That was what, was what I found. Actually, it is quite intuitive because, uh, you know, in the low level vision test, uh, special uh, relationship is so uh, so important. Uh, uh, so because it is actually low level, uh, so task. That, so that when you are manipulating the spatial information uh, significantly, it is uh, quite de uh, detrimental for the uh, end uh, performance. So uh, let's see. Uh, but what I also found is like uh, unlike the uh, feature domain uh, perturbation, if you uh, if you like uh, uh, carefully tune the uh, special domain perturbation or the special domain data augmentation method, you can bring at least some improvements when uh, applied carefully. For example, like cutout, uh, though the improvement is very marginal, uh, the original cutout was actually, uh, you know, like uh, cutting out the box or like a 20, at least 25% of the pixels. But what I did here is like, you know, you reduce the uh, ratio and you may break down this uh, uh, entire box into some 
uh, pixels in individual pixels. So it is 0 0.1. If you draw 0 0.1 random pixels in from entire patches, uh, it gives slightly more like improvement. And um, cut mix and mix up is like this. And mix up is mixing up two like a different images to increase uh, to and giving a, a la smoothed label for in class classification task and in super resolution you you can also try that kind of mix up for like uh, uh so that you can also mix up your uh, uh high resolution images right so if you try that mix up or cut mix like shown here uh this also improves slightly uh show a margin improvement but with some interesting points mix up brings quite a good performance compared to the others uh so giving a gain to the model uh while cut mix is kind of Although it is much more recent one, it gives less uh, performance uh, improvement. So we hypothesize that this is because mix is at least do not have a sharp transition boundary between when you are uh, like augmenting the image, right? Uh, to test this, we tried to mix both methods and found that this indeed brings a much a little slight better improvement. You know, cut mix up is actually you know really a simple edit uh, the the simple integration of mix up and cut uh, cut mix so that you cut and mix an image, but you do the mix up in that uh, mixed patch, right? The, there is a, a co convex interpolation between this uh, interpolated patch. Right. And then you, because uh, of that uh, smooth bound, I think uh, it gives a better like uh, improvement when it is applied to the uh, image restoration models. This is not, uh, I'm showing you here the performance improvement on the super resolution on a specific model. But in the paper, what, I, what we showed is it is kind of agnostic to the models and almost agnostic to the uh, like a lot of low other low level GDM tasks. This trend remains the same. So based on this analysis so far, we try to push our hypothesis further so that uh, uh, if the sharp transition or weird pixel distribution is a problem, for example, the weird pixel distribution is because of mixing up, then we can try really a simple, uh, uh, simple uh, augmentation with uh, just a RGB permutation or blending some like a really constant uh, uh, channel value uh, into into the uh, image. This is looks really simple and uh, stupid, but uh, but surprisingly, this gives a lot of a lot of like improvement in uh, overall like uh, image restoration tasks. Just uh, simply permuting the RGB channel in your uh, ch uh, in your uh, image uh, of low resolution and high resolution, uh, that kind of augmentation effect will give you a boost to your uh, end performance quite a lot. Uh, this is on synthesis uh, data set performance, uh, and it looks small, but when it comes to the real data set, it becomes one or two dB increment. Uh, so that uh, the observation so far is like, you know, sharp, as we hypothesized, sharp transition or mixed image contents within an image page, uh, or if you lose the relationship between pixels so much, it degrades a lot lesser performance, right? So based on this analysis and observations, what we proposed was cut blur. So uh, since cut blur, cut and paste between the corresponding region of a low quality and high quality patches, it minimizes the boundary effect while benefiting from utilizing entire pixels. You know, in cut, cut, cut out, for example, because you're cutting out some of the pixels, you cannot utilize entire pixels. But since here you are cutting and pasting onto it uh, as it is done in the cut or original cut mix, uh, it can you utilize entire pixels, but unlike the uh, cut mix, because you are using your own uh, corresponding region of low quality or high quality patches, uh, there is the minimal like a change in your pixel distribution, as well as there is a minimal boundary effect. So that uh, it kind of imposes the network to learn uh, identity mapping, providing while providing a good regularization. Uh, regularization to the uh, uh, super resolution model. So it gives a nice uh, also on the real SR, uh, which is the real data set uh, and 
giving a 0 0.23 dB, just in, including this coupler uh, augmentation. And the uh, div 2K, which is uh, just a synthetic uh, super resolution data set, it gives a quite nice improvement. Uh, so let's dive more into what it makes the model actually learn, uh, what it makes. Uh, so now, now the model has to learn both how and where to super resolve an image simultaneously. So this leads the model to learn how much it should uh, apply super resolution in the image. Because you're, for example, uh, here, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, really a representative uh, image uh, for maybe the last uh, next one would be better. So uh, no, here. So this part is a low resolution part, which is coupled in uh, uh, a low, re low resolution image, which is coupled with a corresponding high resolution image here. So because the, this is uh, getting uh, into the model, uh, during training, it is kind of like a coupler model can opt, uh, already know that, oh, this part doesn't need more super resolution. So this part needs super resolution. So for this one, you kind of put the identity mapping so that it doesn't touch this, this part, but you would touch only the low resolution part to improve the uh, finer output, right? Uh, this looks really uh, synthetic or really uh, artificial like a setup, but I would say this is actually in uh, real life. For example, like an out of focus image. For example, uh, I will show later in the, uh, the, uh, in the real example that I, I took by using my uh, cell phone that the, if you use the out focusing image, the frontal part of your image is quite high resolved, but the latter part of your uh, background is quite uh, blurred, right? Uh, if you use that kind of image to uh, improve, to be super resolved by using a, a, a model which is not uh, trained with this kind of coupler model, it will kind of over sharp uh, your image in every area because it haven't seen such kind of task. Like uh, some part of the model is low resolution, some part is uh, high resolution, it haven't seen such kind of patches. So that uh, it just uh, simply learns uh, how to super resolve, uh, but not where to super resolve because it always have uh, given the task from you give from re low resolution to high resolution, given every single pixel, it kind of like uh, just uh, no, uh, learns to no, uh, super resolve every each pixel in a no no brain brainer way, right? So this makes the coupler quite uh, attractive in that uh, if you see such kind of like uh, a model, so that uh, I kind of made a situation where uh, in the um, uh, in the uh, test time, uh, you are given with a uh, uh, much more so that the inference model is learned uh, trained on uh, four time scale uh, super resolving so that your it kind of when it is seen in the test time with a much more bigger patch, for example, the half uh, scale uh, image. So it kind of over sharpens the image uh, more than uh, more than much. Like, uh, but when it is trained with a coupler, uh, it is kind of, it doesn't show such kind of weird uh, pattern situation. Like uh, it kind of doesn't uh, give such kind of over sharpening over the edges, uh, but it kind of super resolves in a, a right amount. So that error, I kind of cannot see here that error residue, I don't think you can see here, but it actually, there's a really small amount of error still remain, but it is much more, uh, because I made a scale with same with the previous one, uh, it is uh, much higher when it is not augmented. So, the, ah, yeah, here it is. So that, so I'm kind of, when you are training the model with a coupler, it gives a much more improved generalization, like out of focus image. And not only that, uh, as I said, it kind of Im uh, improves over sharpening. It doesn't give any over sharpening artifact. Uh, so baseline is uh, without such kind of coupler model. So it kind of doesn't give such kind of aliasing effect. So as I said, it is trained on a four times scale factor data set and tests you know, a different scale factor. So it, it kind of over sharpens. And it kind of translates to other EMG restoration tests. It also prevents over smoothing. When you are trained on severe noise and testing on milder noise, the baseline method will smooth out everything. This is a denoising task, but uh, uh, the coupler trained one will give a better result. 
And it also goes for the uh, JPEG artifact things. Um, and it gives much more better research. Uh, yeah, that is actually uh, the, exp the experiment shows that uh, we, in or it is agnostic to different size of models and different size of training data set. And as we all know that if the data set is small, uh, the augmentation effect is much bigger so that we have much more uh, better uh, performance gain while when there is a small data. Um, yep, so these are some qualitative images. And so that is the summary. So uh, and first, data augmentation strategy in low level vision task. A coupler was proposing this work and uh, it kind of improves like other low level vision tests as well. And it kind of also gives a significant improvement when it is applied to the real, actually real data set, like a real SR uh, uh, data set. So that at the time, I think that it was a state of the art performance using a really a simple model just with a data augmentation, which we propose here. So second one is the one I actually uh, uh, presented uh, last, uh, like, I don't know, last year or the, uh, the for, uh, earlier part of this year. It is about the uh, image translation. And this is now uh, uh, presented in ICCB 2021. So to give you a bit of context, uh, let me introduce you a bit of like a brief overview on a history of image translation model. Even I know, I think you will know, but uh, before word, you, to train a translation model, you needed a pair data set, like a pix to pix, right? And um, uh, Junyan Zhu have like a freed that kind of constraint by uh, applying the uh, cyclic loss. So they freed uh, it from pair data set to the unpaired data set. One so unpaired image translation one, but because you are kind of using a cyclic loss, it kind of cause a, enforces a one to one mapping between two domains, so that cycle gun fails to synthesize diverse images from a single input. So and uh, so and some some images like uh, try to like overcome this by using some adding some noise inside so that they there were some works called munit like a multimodal image translation uh, they could like uh, uh, translate uh, an image uh, and try uh, provide uh, uh, several different uh, images of a domain uh, and but the problem is they couldn't like uh, make a model to train on multiple domains uh, so that there was a star done before word. So there was a multi-domain translation, which is separate from separate work from a unit. It was tackling the multi-domain uh, image translation task by giving also another conditions uh, into the model uh, uh, really uh, explicitly. Uh, so separate models are dealing the separate uh, uh, task. So multi-domain, multi-model, but there was no such model which could uh, address the both. And uh, re uh, recently, also in the CVPR 2020, uh, we proposed Stargun version 2, uh, which could uh, do this, like a, a single model, which can deal with the multi-modal generation, with um, uh, dealing the multi-domain generation as well, image translation as well. So that uh, with a single model, it could translate a different type of uh, domains, but and also a different type of uh, images uh, within a within the domain. But the thing is, all of these ex existing models and even the ones which I claim that their most method is a uh, unsupervised method, it was in fact needed at least the set level of supervision. So, but uh, you know, for example, the, the most naive way to make uh, this model happen is that uh, you have a image level supervision pair data set from edge to uh, this image, right? Uh, the cyclic loss have uh, uh, solved this problem by uh, putting the cyclic loss, but it needed a set level supervision at least. Yeah, it kind of needed to collect the data the dogs are here and cats are here and the wildlife is here, right? But in real life or in practice, there are some ca cases, actually many, that even acquiring that set level supervision or domain levels is very hard, right? 
So, uh, for example, like in human uh, face, you know, there's an ages and genders and ethnics or other different types of like uh, domains or like uh, inside a single model. And even more that we cannot actually pick up, right? So that uh, this is never easy actually. So that if you actually make a domain uh, by looking at the data, that means that, that at least you are kind of imposing some bias or when you are selecting the domain, right? Uh, what you want is actually you want a model which can uh, pick up some useful information or clusters inside the domain automatically and learn the translation between each other automatically, right? So that is the goal. Like uh, you make a fully unsupervised me method that can synthesize with diverse and high quality images. So, and this must be easy to train, uh, easily uh, trained and deployed. So we can first start with the clustering method, which was actually proposed before. And what we did was like uh, we, uh, train some embedding model so that uh, between this embedding model, you train a model which can uh, cluster automatically in a different, uh, so a differentiable clustering way. So that we use the mutual information so that by uh, putting this mutual information, uh, you can, you, this, is, uh, this is the uh, uh, loss term. So if you see this in mutual information of one to the other, like uh, what you do here is you have an embedding method and you have a, a sample here and the, the augmented same sample set here, you pass through and you get the embeddings and you kind of try to uh, maximize the mutual information between these two. If you look into this mutual information uh, equation, it is can be decomposed into the entropy and conditional entropy. And what it means is actually, if you kind of, uh, uh, the optimal metrics under this loss will, uh, would be, like uh, you want to kind of evenly distribute uh, between the different clusters while, because you want to cluster, you don't want to actually uh, uh, put everything into a single cluster. So uh, you're uh, maximizing this will increase the, maximizing the entropy will kind of distribute automatically uh, to different clusters while uh, 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 this, minus is like a, uh, what it is, minimizing conditional entropy wants you to kind of like a, in, inside the domain, you are, you are more, if they are inside, inside a single cluster, you, the, you want to minimize the uh, distance inside the cluster. So that uh, this is a, a typical, uh, which is actually proposed already before, which is not our own contribution. We use this just a, a differentiable clustering to make uh, the clustering happen automatically. And, but the problem was the, uh, the accuracy is not that high enough to perform the image translation. Uh, if you use the, at that time, this was the state of the art, like a clustering method, uh, automatic clustering method. And the, it was like a 50.6 uh, uh, accuracy uh, for uh, if we know the cluster and try it on that data set. But at least for the uh, uh, faithful image translation, we need at least a label, a domain label, which has the accuracy over 80%. So for doing that, we what was lacking was the, the embedding space was not that powerful enough to perform the clustering. So that what we kind of like found was there was a, like a, a, some, a, uh, some like a self-supervised learning method, which kind of gave, used a similar same augmentation technique and encoder scheme, which filled well with the previous uh, clustering mes method I explained earlier, that can improve the representation power of your embedding space. Uh, I won't go more in detail, but this is called MoCo. And uh, it, sh it showed that uh, the contrastive loss can significantly enhance the representation power. So the gist of it is to use the augmented code here as a, as a positive anchor point and treat others as a negative samples. And by uh, using this uh, contrastive loss, as well as the mutual information, the clustering loss together, we could uh, make a, a 
model uh, using this contrast loss and a uh, mutual frame together, we could like uh, increase the accuracy from 50 to the 84%. So that now clustering method itself is already really improved a lot. The accuracy is improved a lot. And in, in addition, this is a fully unsupervised and uh, automatic way. So we could like uh, attach it to the uh, any image translation method with the any data set that you don't have any domain level. So our overall screen uh, is like this. Uh, for the time's sake, I will just skip this once. So that uh, this is the ablation study. So that what I show here is like, uh, uh, we there, since there was now not much baseline we can compare with before where it, the few shot uh, unsupervised image translation model says that they are unsupervised, but as we claimed in our paper, they were still using some uh, some amount of supervision that there is a domain level, some at least a few labels in domain level while training. But um, we there was no choice, so that we calculate we just uh, compare with the unit. And if we you uh, if you using our improved architecture, the baseline has been already improved this much. So that given the supervised uh, levels, we could this is the maximum upper bound we could approach. So that but um, using unlike using k-means, if you use differential clustering. So this is much fancier clustering method. There's was uh, a much more better density and coverage, which is another metric for a better representation. But with some, uh, on top of it, if you learn the uh, image translation together, it kind of gives a much more boost in FID as well as other extra systems. So that your model is kind of like a, uh, the generative model and the uh, contrast loss itself is giving some feedbacks to your clustering method so that the uh, model can kind of catch some meaningful uh, uh, information oh, from both tasks, clustering as well as the synthesis. So compared to the supervised uh, level, it even sometimes surpasses the in FID sense, lower the better. Uh, even though this um, finer model haven't seen any kind of labels, unlike the models which have used the domain labels uh, intrinsically. Uh, this system, uh, uh, the ablation study that it, it kind of works even well uh, with a wrong number of clustering, I, uh, which is preset number, the K. Uh, actually the, uh, and we show that the, in the uh, real, uh, the, 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 the true K is 10, uh, it kind of truly gives us uh, much more uh, the best performance, but even in the really uh, uh, bigger case, it kind of gave a cluster in the models. K is wrong with 1000 when the true one is 10, but still it kind of, the model kind of learns to like cluster between the images uh, in uh, the color is coded is the actually the true uh, labels of the each cluster. So um, yeah, that is the, uh, uh, the for the tunit, and now we move on to the uh, much more harsh case that if we go much more further, even uh, from tunit, at least tunit had a clean images to learn an image translation model, right? Uh, it didn't use a domain uh, domain label, but still it had a lot of clean images to learn from some uh, learn from uh, learn from right. So that by looking at a lot of uh, 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 images from some domains, they could at least extract uh, 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 some useful information. But in some uh, medical domain, it is even impossible to uh, have collect such amount of uh, good uh, clean images. For example, like uh, here, uh, I will introduce really slight uh, briefly about the dynamic MRI. So dynamic MRI is a, a imaging technique, which is really a, um, uh, actually what it does is it acquires one line by line like this. So this is the case space, which is actually a furious space uh, to acquire this uh, single image, a spatial image. What MRI measures is a single line per time uh, to fill in that case space. So as you all know, the Fury uh, transform is a one-to-one -one, uh, or, or mapping so that if you want to recover entire image, you need the entire Fury coefficient correctly, right? So, but the problem is uh, dynamic MRI is really, this MRI measurement uh, 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 procedure is so slow that uh, if you really want to like extend this to the, um, 
uh, the moving organ, so the dynamic uh, imaging, uh, it become this the situation becomes worse. So that uh, there is a trade off between the uh, 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 spatial resolution and the temporal resolution, uh, because the sampling rate is really fixed. At least uh, this uh, one acquiring one line is more than one second, I think. So that if you the static image is fine. But because you can wait, but still patient can move a little. But if you think of the organs like Hertz, which beats really fast, like uh, at least once a second, uh, it is almost impossible to acquire an entire line for uh, uh, the, the, the snapshot of the heart at that time point, right? So uh, if you kind of, uh, you have to actually uh, compromise between the spatial resolution and temporal resolution. So that if you do so, the undersampling can cause the aliasing artifact or the movement artifact, whether you compromise the spatial uh, resolution or the temporal resolution, right? So that the, the, uh, the conventional way to overcome this is to use data redundancy over spatial or temporal domain. The, the compressed sensing which solves this model-based optimization problem things is like, uh, you know, because you're uh, almost every part of your body part is not that moving a lot, but you only your heart is moving so that you are, and most part is consistent over the time so that you can use that uh, consistency, for example, total variation uh, regularization over time so that you can solve this kind of problem exploiting the data re redundancy so that you regularly lies the solution space to find such kind of X, which can gives a smoother, like a, a smoother, like a reconstruction, right? The, but uh, this is not enough, right? Because uh, so that people wanted to move on to the learning-based method because it always gave better research than the model-based ar algorithms. But as I showed and uh, told you, Supervised learning is like uh, impossible to use in this case because uh, this is the time frame and the best you can get for one bit of heart is at least just four spokes. I mean by spokes is this is a case based line one two three four line is the best uh, number of measurements you can get per each uh, cycle. So that if you just reconstruct this uh, same. Uh, the image from this Fury sample, you will have this image. So this amount of information is in, uh, acquired per each uh, cycle. So that this, uh, if you see this uh, small patch, uh, this, uh, this part is the uh, beating heart, but it is hardly seen any changes. So just looking at this image, you cannot have any kind of information, right? So that because uh, at the first, at the beginning, even at the beginning, you cannot acquire any kind of uh, image uh, data uh, or measurement, which has a full measurement of this times uh, uh, snap, snapshot. It is impossible to learn any kind of supervised learning because it is kind of pre, uh, pre it is kind of uh, impossible because of the physics. Of the measurements, right? So that uh, we there, what we kind of what I did was like we move on to the some unsupervised learning method, and there was uh, the uh, algorithm which is called deep image prior. So deep image prior is um, nothing but uh, uh, on the CNN untrained CNN architecture, and it learns uh, trains a. Uh, uh, it uses a uh, untrained CN architecture itself as a regular laser. So that it solves this kind of model uh, based optimization, but using the F setup for uh, the generative CNNs. What they are saying here is the, the structure of a generator itself has some kind of a really nice inductive bias that uh, for at least for the some low level Im image uh, restoration task, and it, it, the structure itself is quite enough. What it means is that uh, the output space of this uh, CNN architecture itself is so nice that even though it tries to overfit onto the uh, uh, noise or corruptions onto the natural image, which is smooth, uh, it cannot uh, overfit onto the uh, noisy image, noise itself inside the image, but the uh, natural image uh, in underlying these corrupted measurements or images. So that it favors, somehow favors some smoother signals, uh, which is uh, lurking inside 
the corrupted measurements. So by using such kind of technique, uh, they show that uh, compared to the conventional optimization based method, it, it surpasses the performance. And even when it, the, it, because it is quite flexible, uh, it could uh, by just plugging in different uh, uh, Ford model, it could uh, solve the image in painting and um, super resolution as well. And when compared with that time of state of the art trained supervised learning uh, super resolution network, it still gave quite comparable research. So that um, uh, this was, uh, you know, this number C is a untrained one, which is using only uh, this uh, single image to make this image. So that uh, just to explain once more for those who are not uh, familiar with the image prior, the, this model is trying to fit into this low resolution image, but because the structure, CNS structure itself, is uh, working as some kind of uh, really implicit prior so that it favors some clean image so that it somehow uh, outputs the super resolved image uh, uh, even though it tries to overfit into the low resolution image. Uh, the problem here uh, in MRI is because the image itself is so uh, uh, badly corrupted, uh, even the division prior cannot kind of like uh, find the signal on the line. So uh, the network cannot exploit the, uh, uh, because the noise itself is already structured, though there's no way the network can understand that uh, structured noise is not a signal, but a noise. So the, pro and also the problem is, you know, um, uh, yeah, this is what I uh, explained now. And the other problem is the original division prior is only like uh, using a single uh, time frame, so that it is only for a single image, so that it couldn't like uh, by just optimizing a single model for each frame, it couldn't like uh, use the data redundancy uh, uh, over across the temporal uh, uh, temporal change, right? So that we have had to change that one too. And the original DVD prior was so uh, using a unit so that the input noise size was the equal to the image output size. So it, it was too heavy for medical images, which easily go over 2000K per 2000K output resolution. And it can go over three dimensional images like XYZ or more than that. So we kind of like made it so that we kind of incorporate this kind of, we try to solve this kind of problems by incorporating three types of like components into our model. First, uh, we uh, model the manifold so that the, uh, and so that we could let the model learn from this manifold that the spatial closeness of this manifold is actually translated to the uh, temporal closeness. So that model actually now doesn't have to learn the uh, sequence sure relationship between the uh, measurements, but it is already encoded in the input uh, manifold. And second is like, uh, because now you are, we are using a uh, uh, in uh, that noise and in a manifold, we do not need an encoder. Uh, we are using just the coder architecture so that it is much more lighter. And instead of using uh, 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 the finding a loss function in uh, image space, we are now uh, optimizing the uh, uh, measurement in a case space. We only, we don't like optimize on the image space so that uh, so that the noise here, which is uh, from the uh, from the uh, ill posed uh, inverse uh, like uh, transform from the case space to image space, the struck noise from that doesn't like uh, go into the model. But we are only optimizing over that correct measurements we only had in the case space. So, and uh, in, addition, in addition to that, we are can, can like, uh, 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 we kind of design the uh, manifold with the uh, helical design because the heart is uh, kind of pseudo cyclic uh, uh, movement. So that uh, by using that kind of uh, uh, latent space, we observe that the model can now under even understand the periods of the uh, inside the measurements, so they can like uh, learn the uh, measurement, uh, the clean image uh, lurking inside that noisy uh, uh, data, and um, because this uh, 
the, the fixed manifold of helical design was quite uh, hard. I mean, like it is fixed, you know, uh, not flexible. So that, you know, human uh, heart beating is, all, is not always regular. So that we, I, I kind of made it, uh, the model to uh, be much more flexible to change a little more on the, this fixed uh, interval inside the helix by using a mapping network. So the mapping network now frees the constraint that before where there was an equidistance sampling from this helix. Now, after passing through the uh, mapping network, network can kind of freely kind of change the uh, length between the intervals or the, uh, the periods uh, by uh, just uh, which is adapted to this uh, single data. So by doing that, uh, this is the research actually. This is the uh, uh, conventional method, and this is the uh, simulated uh, uh, true data, the dynamic MRI. So that this is the given data, the information you, you only have. Actually, in the real life, you don't have a ground truth. Uh, so that by uh, doing the model optimizing method, you can achieve this much of movement, but, which is quite stiff. But just using the same amount of information, you could uh, kind of like uh, uh, recover the really a uh, nice uh, movement of the heart by just uh, using that simple like a single decoder model. Uh, compared to the uh, this is the YT uh, intersection, and if you see it, it kind of compared to the conventional model based optimization, uh, it kind of uh, recovers the uh, good uh, like a uh, movement in the heart as well in time per domain. And what I show you here is this reordered method, the uh, previous state-of-the-art method in model-based uh, model optimization techniques in this area. And it is, was a 3 dB improvement, which is two times more quali qualitative uh, signal-to-noise ratio, I guess. Like uh, log two is 0 0.3, yes. And this is now uh, uh, real data. There is no ground truth. So this is the uh, data set from uh, the mother and fetal cardiac motion. So inside the mother's belly, there's a, 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 the baby inside. And there, the baby's heart is moving. And for sure, this type of uh, data, we don't have any kind of, uh, uh, kind of data set to learn such kind of model. So that we only have a single data to measurement for the recovering this uh, type of image. Uh, the previous state of the art conventional uh, model could achieve the movement, uh, find the movement of the herd, but it looks like it is beating so fast because it is kind of using uh, uh, information from other cycles. Actually here reordering means you are kind of reordering the sequences of the other time point as if it is uh, acquired in the same uh, time point at the same like a snapshot. Uh, if you uh, magnify the view, you there is a, like a lot of artifact going around, but uh, since our temporal resolution is in fact actually really high, so it looks like it is uh, beating really slow, and there is no uh, there is no uh, artifact around, so that you can see this is recovered with a single measurement actually per each frame. So uh, th that was all I prepared for today. So the summary was like. Uh, I always go for the more efficient yet effective model with easier manipulation so that and using less data and computation. So um, yeah, that was all for uh, this uh, presentation and I will now accept for the uh, questions. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Jaejeon. See uh, if there are any questions from the attendees. <clears throat> Maybe Hello? really, yeah, please. Sina. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. I had a question regarding the uh, unsupervised uh, image to image translation. So I was more curious to know what was the architecture, maybe the slide that you passed. If you can explain ah. that, I'd, do, I'd be curious to, to know about it. Ah, yeah, sorry that, yeah, I just passed through, but I, I then I will just uh, briefly explain here. So you are uh, you you will be you are curious about it. So here you can see the overview. So I will go one by one. So our overall scheme is as follows. 
to train the generative model first for real images, the guiding network, which I the guiding is the encoder here, encodes a pseudo label and style code using that contrastive loss and the uh, mutual information loss. So using the uh, uh, mutual information, now let's say your model is learning the domain label, pseudo label, and this is the style vector using the contrastive loss so that this is moco loss so that it learns a representation of this image. Uh, so that so in a self-supervised way, it learns to encode the uh, domain label as well as the style. Then using that pseudo uh, label, you train, a, you use a domain specific branch of discriminator. So this is the multi, uh, multi-task discriminator. So there, if the, let's say this is the uh, second domain, it says, it selects the second branch of this discriminator. So that um, using the pseudo label, at first, for sure, this level would be wrong. Maybe it could be assigned some other way around. But while the training goes, it kind of the accuracy became surpasses like eighty percent. Then it kind of always uh, takes the uh, accurate uh, branch, so that the branch is now becoming domain specifically trained. So that the domain specific branch of the discriminator is chosen by this pseudo level, and then it is trained. On the other hand, given the reference image. This encoder extracts a pseudo label and style code again, as we did before. And using the style code, you want to now uh, translate this image uh, to the other one, right? So you want to also discriminate this uh, 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 translated image if it is realistic or not in that specific uh, domain, right? So that using the pseudo label here, which is uh, extracted from reference image, your discriminator is now kind of discriminating if this looks realistic or not, right? So that so, and then this the translate goes into a discriminator and this is repeated for all domains. So for encoder, which I call guiding network here, which extracts the uh, clusters as well as the style of the image is trained with mutual information and contrastive loss. And the other part is just a, uh, adversary loss plus the image reconstruction loss and style contrastive loss. So except from the encoder, which is self-supervised learning using a technique of surface supervised learning, almost every other thing is same uh, with the image translation, typical image translation model. You might, you can even think that if you, we are, you are given with some kind of really nice uh, pseudo label learner, you use the output of that learner, uh, the, the, the uh, clustering method to translate the image translation model. The only difference from the doing that two-step process to this truly unsupervised uh, image translation model is uh, the entire module is trained in a joint way. So while training, it also learns the clustering and the synthesis model together. And by doing so, what I was showing you was that uh, your tra translation model also benefits from clustering method uh, learning and clustering method also benefits from uh, doing the image translation task. Okay, thank you. So basically your generator or your domain uh, adapter is a conditional one, right? Even exactly, the class yes. label. So you have mm -hmm. just one generator. Okay. And if you do them separately, you say it's worse, right? Compared to do them, doing them together. Uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is kind of comparable or better. Like uh, doing the joint one is comparable or better, I would say. In our ablation study, we did much more. Uh, uh, so here, if you see the sequential training, sometimes FID looks a little better and accuracy is, looks a little better. But um, when you see the this uh, precision and recall type of the image, uh, always joint training is always better. And even for the uh, visually, if you see the translated images, the joint training always give, goes, gives a better score. I see. Because initially, when the classifier is not trained well, uh, it's a difficult task, right? Because the discriminator, mm -hmm. you don't have the correct label. And at that mm -hmm. point, basically, Turning gun in itself is difficult, but there also you don't have a, a the set of correct labels, right? True. So, and I think uh, even in the you know the clusters the, for ablation study, I use the data set which has a, a cluster label to calculate the accuracy here. 
But um, that clusters are actually sometimes wrong. And even uh, I actually found some like uh, wrong labels in this data set, but uh, the, the, so that this uh, sequential learning or separate learning kind of leaded the image translation model in a wrong way, but the accuracy looked higher because with that wrong label, it's still the clustering method learned that wrong label. So, but, and also the learned representation, which is using the image translation is not actually uh, uh, adapted for the, uh, for the image translation task, which is uh, end, end, end stream task of that clustering method. So that if you train jointly, the representation space of that clustering method also kind of adapts toward uh, the representation space, which kind of makes the image translation much easier. Okay, so you didn't need in the joint setting to train the first part, the classifier, for some time before having it jointly trained, right? Did you need to yes. do that or no? Uh, I mean that you don't need it, but uh, I, I'm saying that yeah, by doing so, you it kind of benefits from it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> Just to add the question to uh, Tonit, is there any way to induce the diversity of the generated images from output of the generator, similar to what you have done for StarGAN version two, I guess? I didn't get your question. So diverse, how do, how, how you want to use, use the diversity? I mean, within just a domain, for example, domain of the cat or domain of the dogs, if, if there is any way to generate diverse images, uh, similar to a style again that you basically sample from the random distribution. Ah, yeah. Um, yes, uh, you can do that. If um, let me let me check. Um, ah, no, no. In this case, ah, ah, yes. Actually, I didn't explain here, but. Uh, later version in the code actually included this encoder type has some kind of like uh, uh, what you what we did in the experiment uh, in, in for insider insider use what we did is you know you can add another like uh, 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 KL divergence type of loss into this representation space right to uh, kind of follow the Gaussian noise or some kind of that then you can sample from it but as uh, as it is for what I explained here, uh, it doesn't have a like a really diverse uh, sampling uh, uh, module. Mm -hmm. It needs always needs a reference image to sample from uh, something. Thank you so much. If there is any other question, uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> Like uh, for the last part, when you were doing the case space, uh, like recovering the case space mm -hmm. using deep image prior. So what loss did you use? Like, was it uh, like in order to uh, or fit the model, like in order to train the model? So this is all I used. So uh, um, HS is in fact, uh, uh, non-uniform Fourier transform because it is acquired in this way, but actually it, it can, you can think it as a normal Fourier transform. So yeah. that, um, so inverse Fourier transform would be in this way around. So that the output of the F theta, the our decoder, if learned in a uh, ideal, ideal sense, it should output some kind of full image per each Z, which is uh, represent the uh, code per each time frame. So that um, this image, will be translated into the case space so that this entire image will cause the entire uh, output the uh, in output the uh, entire fury space but the loss is only calculated on this lines on the lines okay yeah. so like uh, um, the output of the model kind of tries to fill in between the lines the frequency magnitude uh, yeah yeah it kind of fills uh, but the loss is only calculated at that time okay. point. If you have this one, your line is calculated on this line, second time point, this line, and the other line. But because there was, was there is always a redundancy in underlying this our model because your body doesn't change much. 
so that the model learns the data redundancy while doing uh, uh, doing uh, this uh, update okay. process. Uh, thank you. It's nice. <laughs> So, if there is any other question, I just have another question from your super resolution work, uh, cut blur. You how you train the super resolution network? Is it uh, just train with the pixel wise loss term or uh, use adversarial loss? It is just a really a pixel loss. Uh, I only use the. Uh, for this one, I only use a EDSR, which is a really a naive uh, baseline the old one, 2017, and just uh, putting this cut blur model, uh, just augmentation, you know, as you do for other augmentation, if you put it, it usually increases like 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 dBs easily, uh, for especially for real data sets. Mm -hmm. Because we always want to keep the balance between the perceptual quality and image fidelity. So uh, I see that you use the both metrics, perceptual evaluation, LPIPS, and uh, PSNR. Mm, yeah, true. So that uh, they kind of give quite this data. I in, inside this, uh, uh, there is really nice point. So actually, when I was submitting this paper, I in the supplementary, I also added some uh, uh, GAN-based super resolution models and using this uh, augmentation method. And it kind of gave a post or boost for PSNR as well, because if you use the perceptual loss, usual uh, cases like, you know, the PSNR or the conventional metric goes down because of the perceptual loss things, mm -hmm. right? But these data augmentations uh, kind of like uh, compensates that yeah. loss. So that it kind of achieves the perceptual mm -hmm. uh, quality as well as the conventional loss quality as well. So it was quite nice. And after then, Terra Keras actually, who is from NVIDIA actually talking to me that recently he he published the uh, GAN paper with a uh, uh, few labels, right? So that um, he used the data augmentation itself to uh, train a uh, stronger GAN mm -hmm. and uh, GAN model. And uh, in fact, actually, this has been already shown in this paper too. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh so something I didn't understand, what was the thing that gave you the main boost in terms of performance? Was it the basically the space of the loss that you computed this error or was it also some other changes compared to deep image prior? Ah, okay. So usually deep image prior is using a unit and I just change it to the decoder, but it is just, uh, I don't think that is not a big deal, but I what I think is it is, this two, this first part, uh, and this uh, latent designing. So uh, before, uh, when you are, uh, uh, you know, for for a uh, knife division prior, what you have to do is you sample some Z and you fix it, and you out, uh, overfit into a single image, right? And but if you sample it this from a, a IID sense, uh, the model cannot learn. Uh, that um, so, for example, let's say in this way: if you have a video and you want to like uh, denoise the video for every frame, what you can do in the most naive way you would do is you separate each frame and you will train every single like a uh, DVD prime model per each frame to denoise each frame, right? But that is really a stupid way, and you have to train a lot of models, and so that well, they can and even because your model is overfitted per each frame, the each model doesn't understand each other so that they don't use any data redundancy over the frame. So what you can then easily do is then, then let's uh, use a single model, but just uh, use a, a sample from a 1D manifold. So this line is now uh, uh, giving some kind of sense of the uh, uh, sequence so that by sampling from this line, your model doesn't have to now encode the redundancy between the sample by learning, but because the manifold itself is already having a, uh, the notion of the sequence. So by putting the set zero to the first uh, measurement, 
the matching the last one to the last measurement. What model have to learn is just uh, not a sequential order, but just a uh, redundancy between the uh, spatial domains so that uh, it can kind of encode the uh, information which shares uh, or, uh, across entire temporal domain. So first was like uh, this designing the manifold because we are using the uh, dynamic MRI for heart imaging. What we kind of do is instead of using a line, you already this already gave a boost, but instead of using a line, what you can do is you can use a helix, right? Because it is kind of normal sense. Your heart is a periodic one. You can even use a circle one. And I show in the paper that helix is better than circle because circle is a perfect period. And you're sampling around equidistance means that you are kind of, your heart will perfect, perfectly come back to the original point at each period, but that doesn't make any sense, right? The helix is much more better because your heart, uh, the, each period, it has a same similar period, but it has a flexibility over the Z domain so because 3D helix. But in addition to that, what I add is a mapping network, like uh, which is using the style gun as well, in the same motivation as in style gun did. Uh, in style gun, what style gun actually did was like uh, they also used the mapping network to feed the flexibility to make the model more flexible to the chain and adapt to the data. So if you make a sample from equidistance helix. Uh, that still remains with the distance between each sample. Your heart doesn't really uh, beat in an equi-temporal uh, way. So that the mapping network kind of like uh, uh, gives you uh, uh, some slack uh, points so that the model can adjust between the, uh, the time point between each measurements so that it kind of gives a little more flexibility to the model. And this mapping network gave quite a lot of boost too. I see. So here, the Z is uh, kind of like a 3D space in 3D space, or is it more like just at a given point you are seeing across time? You see what I'm talking about? Is it like a 3D volume of a space and time, or is it just time, basically? Uh, I didn't, I just lost, uh, uh, didn't heard the first part of your question. Uh, is the Z, basically the mm -hmm. Z that is the input of your network, is it like a 3D space, like uh, time and space, or is it uh, ah. just time, basically? Well, so the, the, just uh, uh, explicitly, this is just X, Y, Z, the three-dimensional uh, spatial helix. OK, so, so that this is three-dimensional. Three-dimensional. Okay. But the spatial closeness of each spatial, dice, uh, uh, spatial dimensional helical samples is translated to the temporal point. Right. Yeah. So that spatial closeness will be translated into the closeness into the temporal, like uh, the next sequence and next temporal point, so that the model learns uh, how to encode each frame into each Z. OK. OK, I see. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Jejun. Uh, please keep in touch. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, Hope to see you after CVPR deadline. Good luck for your CVPRs. <laughs> you too. You too. Yeah, and your students. You. And keep in touch, please. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.